Salazar was a journalist that wrote and spoke about the injustices against the Mexican-American community at a time when very few raised those issues, let alone publish or broadcast them. Journalists remember him for his professionalism and integrity. Activists have made him a martyr because of the circumstances surrounding his death. Ruben Salazar was born in Juarez, Mexico and was raised in El Paso, Texas. He attended the University of Texas in El Paso and earned his bachelor's in journalism in 1954. Prior to attending college, Ruben served two years in the U.S. Army. He became a reporter at the El Paso Herald Post, later went to San Francisco, and in 1959, Salazar joined the Los Angeles Times. While at the Times, he served as correspondent in the Dominican Republic and in Saigon during the Vietnam War. While he was appointed bureau chief in Mexico City, Ruben covered the 1968 student protests in that city. In 1970, he resigned his position at the Times and became news director of Spanish language station KMEX Channel 34. Salazar continued to write a column for the Times. By joining KMEX, Salazar felt that he would be better serving the community that he so often referred to in his column at the Times. He expressed this and other views during the show by the name of The Siesta is Over, which aired on KCBS Channel 2 and was hosted by Bob Navarro. The taping of the show was done three months prior to his death. Here you were at the Los Angeles Times, large metropolitan daily and newspaper with an international reputation, riding a crest of a career. All of a sudden you leave the Times, you go to Channel 34, like I said before, a Spanish-speaking station, a UHF to boot, why? The most important thing about my move to me was that I was uh, frustrated. I wanted to really communicate with the people uh, about uh, whom I had been writing for for so long. And at the times I was doing, I think, a, a job that had to be done, and that is communicating with the establishment about our problems. But I wanted to try my hand at communicating with uh, the Mexican-American community directly and in their language. Many feel now that Ruben was ahead of his time. He wrote articles that hit home then and are still hitting home now, 20 years later. Articles like the Mexican Americans need a much better school system, county's affirmative plan to hire minorities reads negative, Mexican Americans dilemma, he's unfit in either language. Who is a Chicano and what is it that Chicanos want? In this last article, Salazar was trying to identify for the Mexican Americans, clarify to the Anglos, and understand for himself who he was. He had succeeded in the very middle class Anglo context. He had sought success through the traditional way, and you give up some of your language and some of your culture, and you assimilate to the Anglo world, and you become sort of a, you know, a brown-skinned Anglo. Uh, and I think he was realizing, no, you don't have to do that, and he was sort of hearing a lot of Chicanos of the 60s saying that and sort of maybe convincing himself that, well, maybe they've got a point. Not sure he'd come completely over to that side, considering himself a Chicano, but he was sure thinking about it, and he was trying to define it for himself. How do I fit into this, and where do people of my generation fit into it? His work was not only recognized in Los Angeles, but throughout the country. He received the Greater Los Angeles Press Club Award twice, and several others, including the Equal Opportunity Foundation Journalism Award. Serious Ruben was questioned about objectivity in the press. I'm only advocating uh, the Mexican-American community, uh, just like the general media is, uh, is advocating, really, our economy, our country, our way of life. So I'm just advocating a community within a com community. He constantly challenged the system and insisted that education was the answer to the oppressed Spanish-speaking community of Los Angeles. I mean, this country is the richest country in the world, and we can do all kinds of things, but there's no money to educate our young, which is uh, uh, the most terrible indictment of this society right now. Because all they, if they want us to stop rocking the boat, all they have to do is educate us. And by God, that's cheaper. Richard Nixon was in office in 1970. This was also a time when the administration felt the media scrutinized them and members of the media insisted on reporting the facts at any cost. Are we as bad as we've been, as, as we've been told, for example, in the last couple of months? Well, we're certainly not as bad as the politicians who, uh, who attack us. Because everything we do is at least in the open. I mean, when you write a story, it's right there in black and white. Do you feel that the Nixon administration has any 
type of a calculated philosophy toward the press? Yes, of course. What is it? Uh, they, they, they don't want the press to rock the boat. And I think the, the press's obligation is to rock the boat. Later, on August 29, 1970, Ruben Salazar and his KMEX crew covered the National Chicano Moratorium March. Approximately 20,000 people, the majority of Mexican descent, gathered to protest America's involvement in the Vietnam War and to decry the high percentage of Mexican-American soldiers killed and wounded in action. What started as a peaceful march ended up in violence. Nosotros empezamos a caminar por Whittier Boulevard, uh, por la acera de la izquierda, bajando por Whittier Boulevard. Y Rubén uh, miraba hacia atrás muchas veces. Y yo le preguntaba por qué. Y me decía, nos están siguiendo. Después de todo eso, nosotros decidimos entrarnos a un bar, a un bar de cortina en la puerta. Y entramos a ese bar al baño esencialmente. Pero al mismo tiempo con la intención de deshacernos de quienes creíamos o pensábamos en ese momento que nos estaban siguiendo. Solamente había una cortina que, está, que cubría la puerta. La cortina estaba aquí. Uno de los sheriffes abrió la ventana, la, la, la cortina, el otro metió el rifle. El señor Wilson que hizo el disparo, disparó a la altura de la cabeza nuestra. Ruben Salazar's head was shattered by a bullet-shaped tear gas projectile. He died instantly. The community was outraged. Family and friends mourned his death. Es una pérdida irreparable. Ruben fue siempre un gran señor, un gran padre, un gran esposo, un gran ser humano, dedicado a la, a la causa de la justicia y lo triste es que haya muerto tan injustamente Ruben left his mother and father Mr. and Mrs. Salvador Salazar his wife Sally two daughters and a son Ruben had a keen sense of perspective and introspection in explaining to our readers the hopes the dignity and the bitter frustrations of the minority population particularly the very large and neglected Mexican American community a community that the Times had largely overlooked until Reuben made us aware of this fact. While friends gathered to offer their last respects, members of the press corps proceeded to interrogate President Nixon's representative at the funeral. I brought uh, a letter to Mrs. Salazar from the president, and uh, I would not go into all of the contents. One of the assurances that were made by the president was that uh, not only lo local law enforcement uh, officers would be checking into Ruban's death, but the Department of Justice, who has already sent a group out here, is going to give it a very thorough investigation. Does that mean that the investigation is underway right now? Yes, sir. Is that going to be a separate investigation from the one being conducted by the county right now? Um, I would imagine, uh, well, yes, it will be. It will have its own integrity, that investigation. In the different publications after his death, many argue that Ruben Salazar wrote an article that upset the police and the sheriff's departments and that his life had been threatened. Others explained that the FBI tracked him for three years, especially on his trips to cover Castro's Cuba. Really Two investigations took place, the, one by the County of Los Angeles, who after interviewing several witnesses and hearing testimony from the officer who shot the projectile, ruled the incident was accidental. The case was closed. The federal investigation was never concluded. Ruben Salazar may have rocked the boat once too many times, but 20 years after his tragic death, the articles we are now reading only remind us that what we print and what we broadcast will always remain alive because the truth can never be silenced. I'm Laura Lucio.